So t- I'm not going to be that long today um, because it's 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 only a short thing that I really need to talk about, um, and um, I'm starving because I've not eaten since first thing this morning. <laughs> so, um, but I'm going to talk about practice now. A lot of people wonder what to do in terms of practice. It's it's one of those age old things where you just, and I especially at this from people when they've kind of they're stuck in a rut. You know, you start learning. And then you learn bits here and there, especially with bass and guitar. It's very much a case of you start learning some songs and then you start watching things online or you get a video of something or whatever it is. And then you start just learning a little bit here, a little bit there. And you can't really get much of a, a like a good practice thing together. Um, whereas in the classical world, there's like methodologies. You know, if you're playing double bass, it's like Simandl method. And, you know, you, there's all these different methods and you work through them and there's all this these etudes that you learn, you start reading and, and you, you have a teacher that, that guides you through all that. But with bass, because most of it's kind of semi-self-taught, even if, even if you've got a teacher, it, it's just fragments here and there. And it can become pretty, well, just unguided and you don't know what you're doing. So I'm going to outline a few things that are worth bearing in mind. Now, if you're an absolute beginner, the one thing I would say is just focus on learning songs. However you're going to learn them, you know, like um, if you're going to learn um, them with tab or learn them reading or learn them by ear, beg, still and borrow to find whatever it is and just learn them. I mean, most of it is by ear, to be honest. That's that's kind of how I got started, just learning things off records, just learning them by ear. But that is the best that you can do as a self-taught. Now, bear in mind, I kind of deal with this a little bit like Jeff Berlin does, because you've kind of got your self-taught thing and then you've got your kind of academic kind of thing. Well, if you're self-taught, and I include most of you that are actually using my courses, because in some ways... Yes, you're getting information from me, but it's not guy. You don't have a one-on-one tutor there. There's no, there's no progressive path from, you know, the absolute beginner through to, you know, virtuoso. It, it, it's a lot of the stuff that I've put together has been for very specific topics. Now I am thinking about trying to put together a very progressive path, but what you do have to remember with something like that is that if you're going to do it properly and this is how i would like to teach my own students you really want a more academic approach to it in the jeff berlin kind of mold so you teach the person to read from a very from word go you know so tabs are out right and you just show reading you teach them actual etudes and and things on the base pieces and then just gradually, gradually build up. And by the time you get to a, like a high level of playing, your reading and your position knowledge and the knowledge of the neck will all be moving up together. So it's a very progressive thing. There isn't really much like that for bass, for electric bass. You could do that with like some of the double bass methods, but they're not exactly, they don't work perfectly with the, with the fretboard. Um, so that would be one way of doing it. But the way that you would do it with, Scott's bass lessons, my lessons, any of that stuff, looking at YouTube videos, it's all pretty much self-taught. You're kind of guiding yourself, but then taking on bits of information. So for absolute beginners, I would always recommend just learn as many songs as you can and try and do as much of it by ear as you can. You know, and learn learn in every style. I mean, obviously you want to start by just learning the songs that you like, but a lot of the time there's going to be things that you do, that you can't play. You know, so it's got to be easy stuff. One of the things that I do have in the um, in the in the, uh, as a course is the Groove Trainer course. Now, obviously, I've got the Beginner course and the Basic Fundamentals course. They are for absolute beginners, and it gives you a good all-round idea of what you're doing. You know, how to change your strings, how to do a bass setup, how to read a little bit, how to do this a little bit. You know, that's all the starter pack. But then after that, the Groove Trainer thing is designed specifically for working through what amount to etudes really the the grooves it's kind of groove etudes starting with the absolute basics so the stuff that you'll look at is going to be more like two three four two three four two three four two three four that kind of thing so that kind of gives you some some uh, material to work on rather than just having to kind of figure out how to play your favorite Metallica tune. Um, 
so it, and that's a progressive set of things. So there's 60 of them in the first one and then 60 in the other. So it's 120 grooves that you can work through, building up to ghost notes and funky kind of things. So I would recommend anybody that um, is having problems trying to figure out, you know, when you're a beginner and you're trying to figure out a, a kind of, sm you know, you want material to learn, you want grooves to learn. That's a good solution to that problem. Now, as well as that, um, like once you've, been working on that kind of stuff and you and you can you know you can play a few, a few grooves so if you can play you know you know stuff like lady marmalade and all those kind of things once you can play a few grooves get around the instrument got your fingers you know you can your finger pickings getting somewhere your fretting hands getting somewhere then once you want to put together a proper study routine I would definitely recommend um, the thing that I call RAYS. It's an acronym that I created, and it's uh, I talk about it on the website in the members area. There's a, a thing in the practice uh, room uh, all about RAYS. So I'll just work through that. So bear in mind, this isn't necessarily just about practice. This is about study, okay? Cause, so I like to talk about... Um, areas of study rather than just practice because practice could be anything you could be sat you know you could be working through arpeggios and things like that but in terms of actual study and gaining knowledge things you you need to break it down into certain areas and um put it this way let's say that you've been practicing for a while and all you've been practicing is is technique and and some you know some tunes and you can play some rush tunes and you know you, you're getting somewhere with it but it's it's all based on your actual physicality but you don't really know anything about harmony you, you can't read you can't do uh your ears not too good all that kind of stuff but you you know physically you can kind of play the instrument if you one day were in a car crash or something like that and you broke your arm right and you were out of playing for six months or a year or something like that i don't know you're in a whatever it is right and you can't play and you lose all your chops and your you know your fingers just don't work as well anymore you would be knackered you'd have to get back to that but if you have the knowledge if you if mentally you've got more musical knowledge then it's going to be a lot easier getting back into playing because let's face it a lot of bass playing is not that physical a lot of it is going to be you know that kind of thing or you know or you know it's not that tricky from a physical standpoint but yet you can you will be able to create bass lines you know like if you've learned how to play walking bass lines if you've developed your harmony knowledge if you've developed your you know your knowledge of arpeggios and scales and how to construct things how to melodically work through a uh, through a chart you don't need vast chops to be able to do that you can just start playing again so it's all about developing more of your actual musicianship your musical knowledge so from that angle i would say that you definitely need to start thinking more as a musician and less of a bass player first all you can do is think of being a bass it's all bass 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 but then as you want to develop you need to start thinking music and musical knowledge so that's where this raise thing comes in so let's just um work through those um what is it five five letters there so basically r is reading a is applied harmony i is improvisation s is style and repertoire and e is ear training now if you to work on all of those five things that's kind of a road to becoming um, a, a professional musician. Now, I include style and repertoire, and someone like Jeff Berlin would say, no, you don't study style, you know, and that. Well, you're not necessarily studying it, but if I'm telling you, if you're going to be a professional music, you are going to have to be able to play within certain styles. Yes, all the nuts and bolts of music is going to be exactly the same, no matter what the style, but you need repertoire. If you're going to be a professional musician and make a living out of it, or even if you just want to learn how to play, it it really really helps you if you have a good repertoire you just learn loads of songs so we'll get into that in a sec as well so first things first are reading so this doesn't necessarily mean 
just reading standard notation, although that is a big part of it. So you could just learn to read standard notation, which you would do from my Simple Steps to Reading course. Um, it's pretty hard to get into reading if you don't have a course like that. You know, you can get a teacher, but they're going to be giving you bits of material here and there. You really want a structured course for learning how to read. Um, and that's where that Simple Steps to Sight Reading comes in. That is structured from absolute basics right through to advanced professional playing, right? Um, so that that's your reading side taken care of. But but I also, in, the, in that reading, on, in the R read chord charts that's just as important for a bass player so if you've got a chord chart and it's like c and then two bars and f and then g just taking a chord progression and then two bars of c f g you know looking at the chord qualities knowing that it's a c major an f major and a g major knowing that knowing your chord tones for that so that as you're moving just being able to connect them with passing notes and things like that um, but the very act of reading a note on the page and then transferring it to the bass is not as good as learning standard notation but it's it's still pretty damn good because you're going to get to learn the notes on your neck really, really well. So whatever it is, you know, just you can find chord charts all over the place on the internet. I always like um, uh, recommending either the real book or the things like uh, the Beatles anthology, although it's a bit hard to get that now. There used to be a book called the Beatles anthology um, that was about this thick and it had every single Beatles tune. And I used it actually for um, uh, when I, um, for practicing piano as well but you, you can just work your way through the chord progressions and, and you know you don't need to play along to the originals you just sit there just there's a c there's a c there's an f there's an e play an e you know just stay in a position move into a different position that's also reading so so the r here is either sight re well not i say <laughs> sight reading it's um it's it, it is sight reading but it's uh it's just reading um that's why it's, well, it's not S's, it's R, <laughs> rays. So it's reading. So reading notation or reading um, chord charts. So then A is applied harmony. So this is basically functional harmony. So this is learning harmony and how it applies to the instrument. So when you learn harmony, you learn a few nuts and bolts things like intervals. It, I mean, you're basically learning music theory. You learn chord construction. So you learn arpeggios, chord tones. You learn scales. So there's all of that stuff, but then you learn about chord progressions and how chords interact. So you learn that if you're in the key of C, for instance, you've got chord one is C major, chord four is F, chord five is G, and chord C is one. There is one, six, two, five, one. You get to learn all of that. You learn about cadences, so you learn that you learn about authentic cadences, plagal cadences, all that kind of thing. Um, you learn the function of chords within a key. You learn about dominant to tonic. You learn about subdominant. So that chord four leading into chord five. Play gold cadence like four to five. Um, loads of stuff. What secondary dominant chords are, triton substitutions, all the jazz harmony, all of that stuff. And you learn it applied to the bass. So, you know, you learn arpeggios. And you learn the appropriate... The, the appropriate chord scales and you learn how all of that works it's the only music theory that uh, that you really want to be studying but like i said this is this isn't just about practice this is about areas of study so yes you practice these things but it's not a case of just like oh i want to oh, i can't think of anything that i practice i've run out of you know tunes to play it's it the, these are longer um or larger scale areas of study where you you know you have to devote a certain amount of time to doing it so that's another part of so that's applied harmony i is improvisation now this doesn't just mean sitting there and it doesn't mean soloing uh, soloing it can mean making up bass lines. And it can mean making up bass lines through one of those chord progressions I was just talking about. So if you're playing... You know, 
whatever it is, you know, making up riffs, improvising, just creating stuff, making stuff up, right? And it helps if it, you know, if you're making use of all that applied harmony and the reading as well, you know, working through a, a chord chart. But it's improvising bass lines, so walking bass lines, that are the perfect example, just making up a bass line through a chord chart, improvising a bass line in a rock setting, improvising it in a reggae setting, in a soul setting, whatever it is. And then also, um, uh, and then improvising melodic, uh, melodies. So, you know, improvising over a, a chord chart, you know, just, you know, whatever it is. Oops. Oh my God. <laughs> the string just pops off. You know, just a melody like that, just a melodic line, whatever it is, just... Just creating melodies, getting back in tracks, just trying to, you know, play over a, a, a basic uh, back in track, you know, if it's a kind of bl a more funky kind of thing, so you're going to be like, let's say it's in E and you're over a... Whoops. You just all the little ghost nutty kind of things. Yeah, just little things like that, just making stuff up. Again, that's improvisation. So that's that's another one of the things to work on. Uh, then style and repertoire. So, or you could say songs and repertoire, but but style and repertoire is um, is basically just learning loads of songs. When you go to start playing gigs with people, uh, especially if you want to kind of make any money out of it, then you're going to be having to take gigs with bands where they're going to give you a set list and you're going to have to learn a bunch of tunes. When I very first started doing that, I, um, I started taking gigs with like disco bands and soul bands and function bands and all these jazz bands, all these different bands. And the first time that you play with one of these things, uh, one of these bands, you have to learn all these tunes that might give you 25, 30 songs to learn. And then you learn them, and it's a lot of work, and you get them down, and then you go do the gig, and it might be a week's notice or something like that, so you have to learn all this stuff. But guess what? Once you've learned all those, you, you don't really have to learn them again. You might have to brush up on them, but let's say another disco band is out there, and they're doing, you know, same kind of stuff. They do the standards of that style. They might have some extra ones that you've never seen before. Well, you only have to learn a few more. Maybe the arrangements are a little bit different, you know, because they might be using different, yeah, different arrangements. But by and large, you're going to be able to fit in quite easily into that other band. Same with Soul. You know, you're going to be learning all that same stuff. Mustang Sally, Land of a Thousand Dancers, Soul Man, all that stuff. You know, you're not going to... With stuff like Soul Man, like... That's always going to sound like that. You, once you've learned it once, that's it. You've got that. And then... You know, it's always going to be the same stuff in there, but it, they just might move it around a little bit. Or you might have a, you know, a medley where, where you just whip through a few of them. But it makes joining another band so much easier. And also, if you're studying all of this other stuff, like Applied Harmony and, you know, whatever you're going to see it in application. It's one thing learning all the nuts and bolts of music theory, but it's another actually seeing it in application. You know, if all you're learning is like a, um, a major arpeggio and a major seven arpeggio, a dominant seven arpeggio and a major scale, Lydian scale, mix of Lydian scale, it kind of means nothing unless you see it actually in application. But the minute that you actually start seeing these things, um, you know, and seeing intervals there, you know, if, you, if you're working on ear training, you'll start seeing and hearing these things in application. And so it all starts to, you know, cement in your mind a lot, lot better because, like I say, you're seeing it in application and it doesn't seem like a waste of time anymore. So, um, yeah, that's that. And also style um, it, it's learning different styles, you know, like learning a disco style and a soul style, seeing what the tone is like in them, seeing how the, all the little intricacies of, of how people might phrase in them. And um, and also, let's say the actual um, the kind of the, the style of playing like slap, I would say slap comes under this banner. Of, so if you're going to be, you know, that kind of playing is going to be in a funk, disco, pop style. It's it's a stylistic thing. You don't really get that in 
classical music, and you don't get it. I mean, you do get it in metal, but it's it's, it's less of a thing in rock. I know that I know that Flea and you know, <laughs> I know it's there in rock, but it's way more um, a funk kind of thing. You know, when it's utilized in uh, metal and rock, it's actually it's bringing those kind of funk that funk styling into that rock styling. Um, I know that people use double thumb in these days to actually get more of a, you know, it's not really funky in that sense. But, you know, that I would class as a stylistic thing, as is walking bass. So if you learn walking bass, that's from a jazz and blues background. So if you start learning how to play walking bass, again, I'm putting that under this S, right? And then finally, the E is ear training. Now, that doesn't mean just sitting there and doing solfege exercises, uh, going <laughs> do re mi fa sol. You know, it's not just that. It's actually just ear, uh, ear training, as in transcribing, just working out tunes by ear. Now, just play a tune on, you know, on a whatever it is, Spotify or you know, on a CD or whatever, and you just sit there, stopping it, playing it again, stopping it. You listen to a note, it's like, oh, where's that note? I mean, it's that basic at the f at first. If you if you've got if you're not used to transcribing. When you first start doing it, there's going to be a lot of this, like play, stop. You'll hear that, and it'll be play, stop, play, stop, play, stop. It's like, oh, what is it? And then trying to find the note, and eventually you find it. Everybody goes through that when they first start, and then eventually you start to hear patterns. So if you hear, you know, like a major arpeggio, you'll hear it, you know, and, you know, if you've learned that, and then you know what it sounds like, then you'll start to hear it, and then you eventually start to hear the actual key, so you'll start to hear things you know, you'll start to hear, you'll start to hear authentic cadences, you'll hear those cadences in there, you'll hear turnarounds, you know, you'll hear that kind of thing. It's just amassing this vocabulary, but you do all of this through uh, transcription, and transcription is one of the best things that you can do, and I would put that high on the ear training side of things. Um, also, another good thing that you can do with ear training is just singing the stuff that you play as you play it. So if I'm playing something like, I might sit there and go, ba 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 bum, you know, just play it, try and sing it, ba 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 bum, and like sing along with it, ba 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 ba. You don't have to think of do re mi fa so. You don't. You don't have to think of solfege. You can actually just bum 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 bum, da 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 da, whatever it takes. You know. You know, you, you just gradually start to learn how these things work. Because if you can, if you can, you just take like a G major scale like that, and then learn to sing up through that, and then you maybe do one note at a time. So, mumbling along it doesn't matter whether you're in tune out of tune i'm a terrible singer but you know you get to learn and then you want to do the same thing with intervals so you want to know learn arpeggios learn sevenths and sixths and fifths and all of that stuff and that's that's all the training so that's the areas of study now how do you go about doing that how do you incorporate all of that into your practice well the ultimate way to do this as, as, as i mean you can you can practice these things individually and that's you know when you first start doing any of those things you want to practice them individually like reading don't try doing too much practice reading on its own just focus on that anything that you're going to do focus on it hardcore for a for a, a certain length of time uh, and then eventually you'll start getting bored of it and then you can move on to something else. I did that all the time. You know, you start practicing something, practice, practice, practice. And then and then you start thinking, oh, I'm not getting as far as I want to. And then, and then try something else. And then practice your harmony stuff. Practice your arpeggios. Practice your scales. Improvisation. Try doing some improv. You can create a practice um, routine made up of those things. And the ultimate way is to have a single practice um you know, something to practice that incorporates multiple aspects. So if you've got something like a, um, a jazz standard, right? And you, uh, let's say it's all of me, right? So you're reading through it, it's got C major, and then you've got this E7, and then, uh, you know, working through it like that. 
well, there's a lot of things you can do there. You can actually learn to play walking bass lines through it, or two feel. You know, etc. So you can make up a bass line through it. That's improvisation. You're also reading because you're reading the chord chart. And if there's a written bass line, that's even better because you've got something to read in terms of standard notation. And um, you're, exp you're learning a bit more about harmony if you analyze the harmony there. So you look at the chords and think, okay, what have we got in, in all of me? It starts on a C major, it's in the key of C, that's chord one. Then we've got E7, which is chord three, but it's a secondary dominant. So I'm not going to explain all this, it's just that I'm just demonstrating how you would uh, analyze it and what you would learn. And then A minor, we're moving to chord six, etc. So you can analyze it. Um, and also ear training, you could actually transcribe bass lines from that tune. Now I'm just using all of me as a as a complete example, but um, the, and also like I said, style. You're actually getting to learn style there. You might be playing a walking bass line or a two feel, and you you gain in repertoire by playing round and round on it, memorizing the chord progression. You gain in repertoire, so you get to incorporate a load of different things, but. Obviously, a lot of those things, you have to focus on them individually before you can put them all together, okay? Otherwise, you're just spreading yourself too thin. Um, loads of people like to think of making these practice routines, um, and I, I've done it loads of times. You know, when I was younger, I'd be like, okay, right, I'm going to spend 10 minutes learning scales. I'm going to spend 10 minutes practicing tunes. I'm going to spend 10 minutes doing this, or, or more, an hour doing one of those aspects. You know, and you develop this practice routine. You know, there's the infamous Steve Vai practice routine from when he was at Berkeley. That's fine, and a lot of people can stick to that, but the problem is I kind of see those routines as a bit like diet plans. Everybody starts out, you know, doing it, you know, you do it for a week, you do it for two weeks, you think, great, I'm just, you know, I'm steaming on with this, this is great. And then life gets in the way, you go on holiday, and then you come back and it's like, oh man, I, or, or you have to do something, you just don't have the time. You know, and then before you know it, it's gone, and you and then you've got to start from scratch again. So. I would instead of of focusing on, uh, sorry, instead of spreading yourself thin and trying to do too much, just focus on one thing at any one time. So if you're going to practice reading, just practice reading. Just practice reading for like a month. Just do that, even if it's only for ten minutes a day. Depends how long you've got in the day. Obviously, if you've got if you've got hours and hours to kill, then you can start doing you know spend longer on it. But don't get distracted too much. You know, just focus on one thing. Really, really focus on that, and then the next day, focus on it again. And after a while, you'll build up some of that, you know, some of those um, neural neural pathways, you know, are going to develop, and you'll, you know, your physicality will improve, and just your general knowledge will improve. And so, for me, it's all about focusing. Whenever I'm practicing anything, I'll just focus on that. I don't, I don't really practice multiple things in a day. If I'm going to be practicing a tune, I practice that tune. If I'm going to be practicing improvisation, I'm going to practice improvisation. I don't sit there going, oh, scales. I mean, now, the other thing that I haven't touched on here is technique. Uh, so I generally look at um, the other stuff, the more fundamental sides of playing as, well, you could call it the three T's. So technique, time, and tone. Now, your tone, you're not exactly going to practice, you know, that's, you know, but you want good tone. Now, tone doesn't necessarily just mean deciding on which distortion pedal you're going to use. Tone can just simply come from good fretting of a note, you know, playing that instead of or, or <laughs> that, or playing consistent volume consistent note length instead of you know consistency and just getting a good tone out of the instrument with your actual hands uh, and obviously developing the right tone for the the style you know and that does involve messing around with your tone controls and things like that but that's tone time again that's something that you 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 will develop through exercises and, and and learning you know um reading and 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 learning it's, but it is it's a very much a um an overall playing thing where the more that you play the more that you practice the better your technique gets the better your time's going to get a lot of people don't realize but 
ta- uh, technique has a direct influence on your time. So your rhythm suffers when you have bad technique because if you're playing something and you just cannot play it, so if I'm playing up through a, um, you know, if I can't play that and I'm, you know, having problems with the actual fretting, you're going to, the, well, the problems, the hurdles that you're having with your hands, the physicality of it is going to create little delays in your actual plane and it's just going to, the timing is all going to go wrong. So technique, if good technique, and I don't mean shredding, I just mean the ability to play, get around the instrument with fluidity will help your timing a lot, as will reading because you will learn about um, how uh, rhythmic sub, uh, subdivision works and how all the you know an organized system of rhythm so knowing that when you look up 16th notes that you're going to have those little rhythmic cells of like one e and da and then one and da so one so one and a two and a three and then one e and two e and three e and and then um, one and two and three and one e two e you know and uh, one e and uh, two e, so that's a sixteenth, eight sixteenth. By learning those rhythmic cells, uh, which you do when you're reading, and then putting them together in various different ways. Uh, uh, you know, all of those different. That that was all four of those main rhythmic cells put together. By putting them in different combinations, different permutations you begin to hear things differently. So when you're listening to a tune and you're trying to work it out, you can actually hear those subdivisions, those rhythmic cells, groups of them, and you can keep your foot tapping and you can have them work around your foot. When you're not thinking in terms of the actual subdivisions and how they relate you know, on the grid to your foot, then you're going to be easily distracted and you're just going to quantize them one way or the other and you're just not going to be accurate. The more you practice your actual rhythm in terms of reading them and learning about them, the more accurate you're going to become because you'll know where they fall with much more accuracy. So um, that's time. And then the uh, so we had t- uh, time, technique, and uh, sorry, tone, time. And t- for technique, well, yes, you can practice your technique and I've got the technique builder course. You know, you do want to add technical etudes into your plane you know you want to practice your technique and but when i'm talking about these three t's i'm just talking about the actual fundamentals there of having a good consistent technique like the foundation of it i don't mean learning how to play like ingvar malmsteen on bass i just mean being able to fret correctly just good just fretting with consistency good position shifts you know, just the the absolute foundations of it. And uh, I talk about that a lot in the Technique Builder course. And uh, I also talk about that in the Cyborg Bassist in the book. Uh, and then, you know, those etudes in that book, they really, really help out with it. But Technique Builder and, um, and the Cyborg Bassist really focus on technique. Um, like I said, the RAISE, R-A-I-S-E, the, the acronym I came up with, with the Reading, Applied Harmony, Improvisation, they're general areas of study. They're things that you would, you know, think of it like a music college. You know, you're going to go to your history lesson, you're going to go to your theory lesson, your oral lesson, your performance lessons. Whereas, uh, that, well, that's what RAISE is. But the three T's there and that technique, that's something that you want to work on in everything that you play. So when you're working on your reading, you're, you're working on good technique because your fingers are on the instrument. It's hands-on. Applied harmony, if you're playing the arpeggios, you know, again, you're working with good technique. You're always ensuring a good technique. And it's all just about getting the basics right. If you can get the basics right, you know, just work on that and always be conscious of it, then you don't have to think about, oh, I've got to work on these technical exercises, these technical exercises all the time. Um, yes, in Technique Builder, I've got those etudes, but they're not just mindless technical exercises in the way that maybe, you know, that kind of thing is. The more actually working on specific um, scales, um, you know, like modes, uh, arpeggios, there's classical things in there. They're, they're things that are um, they're etudes based on application. So all the little things that I work on in there, like various things where you're working on your, well, stretch, but actual position shifts. All of the things in that course 
are uh, based on certain things that you will play at a later date, let's say. So it's, um, it's more in application. So technique, you want to get your basics right. You want to be able to just make sure that everything that you're doing is going to have consistency and then apply it in everything that you do. Like I said, style and repertoire. If you're learning how to slap, make sure that you're working on a good foundation in your technique. Um, uh, improvisation, as you're playing and, and uh, you know, I played that lick earlier. You know, just like a little a little lick, right? Just as you play that, it's, it's based on a major 7 arpeggio. It's just... It's, I've got to use good technique, otherwise it's all going to get messed up. So you don't have to work on your technique in the same way that you do studying those other bigger things. It's more just something that you get the basics and then you just apply it in everything that you play. Um, and just uh, one last thing here. Um, yes, yeah, study pieces. So I've also, um, I'm a big advocate of always having a good study piece to work on. So always have something that um, that's kind of just outside of your ability, that's, that, that's a challenge for you to learn. Um, it could be something like, you know, YYZ or, you know, Teen Town or something like that, you know, a Jacko thing, it could be something a lot easier. It could be, you know, who knows, just something that's just that outside. But something that's a longer thing, a longer piece. Um, classical pieces are perfect for this because they've got, there are much longer pieces with melodic content. There's there's a lot going on in them. And the, because they're melodic, they're a bit easier to remember. It's easier to remember, um, you know, something like... It's easier to remember that than it is this. When it's moving through a chord progression or something like that, you know, if we're moving from there to to here to there to there to there to there to there, to there wherever it moves, okay, because there's no melody in there. So on on some bass lines are, are not that easy to remember. You know, when you're remembering a whole piece, you know, it's like oh that one I've got to play it eight times, and then there's there's two bars of it, and then and then it goes to oh, and then it just stays on that E, and it's for like nine bars, you know, things like that. But there's nothing to really let you especially if you're playing away from the original it's like there's nothing there for you to remember you just have to literally sing along with it whereas if you're playing oops, you can sing along with it you know, you do, it, it kind of you kind of sing along with it in your mind as you're playing it and it's uh, it all just you know, it's, it's way easier to remember. So study pieces are really good. I've got two of them on the website. Um, the um, uh, Prelude in G and Prelude in C. Uh, and there's, they're coaching. They're like classical coaching things. They're, you have to be... Uh, they're not for absolute beginners. They would be for intermediate players, really. Um, or just below intermediate. Uh, but also there's the Solfeggietto uh, practice um, diary that I've got on on the uh, on the site as well. That that's another uh, study piece, but that that one's advanced. But um, yeah, so study pieces are always good. I'm actually going to devise another set of study pieces that uh, that are easier, like some classical pieces that um, that you can work on that are dead easy. You know, just for beginners, basically. You know, like you know, minuet in G and, and things like that. And uh, and then I'll add those. So, yeah, so we've got rays, so that's the, oh, well, sorry, if you're an absolute beginner, just if you missed out the beginning, it's learn songs, just learn absolute basics of songs, unless you've got a music teacher that has a method that can work you up from the basics, you know, in terms of reading and, and you know, working through etudes like that in a more academic sense, in the, certainly in the Jeff Berlin um, way of teaching. So there's that. Or you've got, got your self-taught way, which is more what uh, all sites like mine and SBL are based on, where you kind of create your own path, but you've been given the, the means to do that. Um, so, yeah, from an absolute beginner, for an absolute beginner, you want to be working on tunes. Just learn as many songs as you can in as many styles as you can. Um, and then, or my Groove Trainer course, that, that gives you some stuff to work on at that level. 
Uh, and then beyond that, as soon as you start getting around the instrument, raise, R-A-I-S, I see, I've already talked about that. So reading, applied harmony, improvisation, style and repertoire, and ear training. They're the five main um, areas of study that I would recommend. There aren't really many more. I mean, that's that kind of breaks down all the stuff that you do in a music college all into a, an area of study, um, into areas of study for a, uh, a beginner. Well, not a beginner, more intermediate. And then uh, technique, tone, and time. They're the things that you should be working on all the time while you're doing that. They're the fundamentals that you are constantly working on. So, uh, yeah, so that's the practice um, thing. <laughs> They've got the spin class going on next door, so you can hear you know, respect uh, playing there. Um, so, yeah, so I won't hang around too much longer. So... Uh, Hopefully that's helped a little bit. I talk about that raise there on the website in the practice room. So there's a little bit of stuff in there about it. Okay, so let's uh, just see what the comment we've got in the comments. What's your take on string bass studies like Sim Mandel, Sturm, and uh, reading technique, musicianship, etc. Really good. Um, what happens in more academic study methodologies like that is that the, the, like the double bass... Um, gets broken up into positions and that's how I go about it in the simple steps to sight reading so my simple steps to sight reading is very similar um, so you basically have a set of different positions now um, on bass you would probably be sort of seeing first position as maybe first fret and then second fret depending on where you've got your first finger um, there are other different methods that that split it in different ways but it's basically sticking a bunch of notes in an area so that you can read them and then having another area so that you can read that same set of notes on there but in a higher area so you're breaking the bass up into these positions it's what i do in simple steps to sight reading and it's what's great about things like simandl um but there are elements of it that don't translate as well um just because of the nature of the size of the instrument and just the nature like thumb position and things like that but it's um but there's certain i mean there's you you can't it's not like it would be bad you know like if you learned, if you took simandl if you actually started working through the simandl books yeah i mean you're gonna learn to read you're gonna because the, the positions would work pretty much and you'd learn i mean there's a lot of etudes in there Thanks, R. Hudson. Do you recommend Cordify? I've never really used Cordify. I used to play piano in my teens, and I was a better piano player than I am a bass player now, but I think I'm a better musician now than I was then. Bass uh, uh, taught me so much more about music. Yeah, uh, I've, I've actually found that with some pianists when they've learned from being young, like, like certainly with me. I, I became a better musician as a bass player than I ever was as an organist uh, when I was a little kid. Uh, you, you just sort of learn chords and melody and things and you just read what you're given when you're younger and you don't really think about the rest of the nuts, of bolt, uh, nuts and bolts. Whereas when, it's, you know, when you start playing bass because you're getting thrust straight into doing certain things, you have to kind of learn, you know, like if you're going to make up bass lines, that's not something that you would learn with like standard methodology and like learning classical piano. You don't learn, oh, I'm going to learn how to improvise bass lines through a rock chord progression. You know, so you have to learn a little bit more about um, harmony, let's say. Uh, transcription, do you mean listening to a song then writing bass line out in notes on a stave? Uh, no, um, you, could, you could just be learning it. Just in, 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 and to be honest, you're probably better off at the beginning just actually memorizing it. And then once you've met, even if you, if you can read music and write it, then do that afterwards or do it at the same time it doesn't really matter but i actually find that actually just memorizing it you know learning it by ear and memorizing it you're building up your repertoire a little bit better so even if you're going to write it out you still want to memorize it uh what about technique does that come with learning songs yeah technique like i said technique is an overriding thing you can focus on it as a, as a specific thing with technical etudes, um, but I certainly wouldn't f um, consider giving those to an absolute beginner. Um, that's the kind of stuff that comes a little bit later. But it's more that everything that you do, you're going to be looking to get consistent technique. Because, trust me, a lot of this, 
you know, hardcore, like, ability to fly around the neck like Billy Sheehan is... That's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about technique. I'm talking... Because that, all that is is just being able to play very fast and very, you know, taking technique to a certain level. It's brilliant, and I love Billy Sheehan. But um, all it is is taking, like, the basics of, of good technique, you know, a foundation of technique, and then just honing that until you become really, really good. But you can practice good technique as a beginner equally as much as you can when you're Billy Sheehan. To become fast on an instrument, that's not technique. Fast, you can be really sloppy and fast. Um, you know, you're looking for consistency of tone, you're looking for consistency of, you know, just, just every bit of it. You just want to have this nice, slick um, ability to move around the fretboard. It'll help with learning songs a lot. I'm on roots and fifths on chord tone course, finding out a bar pivot root fifth with pinky finger on the AD. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you mean, one thing to, uh, that you might not have, that might work for you, is that when you do that, so can you see I'm using that fourth finger there for the fifth fret on the D and the G and I'm barring it like that. It isn't just a case of doing this. I'm actually pivoting that, that, that out of, I mean, focus. Get back in focus. Look what I'm doing with the hand. I'm exaggerating it there. I'm doing that. I'm levering the hand. So I'm actually keeping it a little bit bent, to be honest. If you keep it, if you make it too flat, it's going to hurt. So I actually keep it a little bit bent and actually lever with the hand like this. I mean, it'll take a, a little bit of building of the finger. You know, it's going to be weak at first. But, um, you know, it's, it's you keep it a little bit bent and actually lever with the hand more so that you're actually just shifting the, the weight distribution or pressure distribution. Um... I like to have make two to five minute small exercises that I use for warm-ups on a small daily 20 to 30 minute sessions. Yeah, I mean, I don't use warm-ups that much. I mean, you could use some of the exercises that are in that technique builder for warm-ups. But basically, I kind of treat, um, I like, to, if I'm going to have to warm up, um, I'll just basically play through some songs. Um, or I might play some scales, something like that. Uh, but you can use the exercises that are in the technique builder course as warm-ups. You know, so if it's something like, uh, um, I can't even remember, let me see. I've got it here, actually, Technique Builder. I can never remember the etudes. Um, so let's say that one. Uh, you could play that slowly, just, just just trying to get good technique as you're working through work through it like that then move to a different move to C sharp etc and just just work it uh, chromatically up the neck uh, and then try some of the other ones I mean what was the one with the double uh, there's a double note one that's pretty good repeated notes there we go You know, you can actually just work through that, uh, and it gets your fingers working. Uh, what was it? Yeah, work through on that slowly. Just working on things slowly. Don't try warming up fast or anything. Uh, you know, you, the idea is that you're warming up. Or just play whatever you're going to practice. Let's say that I'm going to be practicing, I don't know, you know, solfeggiato. I might warm up by just re very relaxed. You know, work through it like that. Just playing what you're going to practice slowly. Just getting your fingers on the... Or, or just, you know, even stuff like playing a two-feel. Go like... Mm -hmm. 
you know, with a backing track. That's that's pretty good. I found that when I did those cruise ship gigs that were so... I mean, a lot of the stuff we were playing was boring as hell. But uh, especially when you're doing ballroom stuff. You know, you're doing foxtrots and <coughs> waltzes and quick steps and things. Uh, if we ever did that kind of stuff, it's, you know, it's so... There's no... There's no technique needed for it at all, but, um, or in terms of, you know, playing fast. But I found that when I did, like, let's say I've just come off a four month contract doing that, and all I've been playing is like really basic stuff, I found that my hands were in way better condition than they ever were from practicing to a click, trying to play the black page or something like that, you know, just, or you know, playing really fast, intricate things, you know, and just burning myself out to a click. I found that actually just playing really simple stuff consistently actually did my hands way more good. Like, I'd, I'd just find that I'd be able to just fly with the with my actual speed <laughs> from just playing all those easy things because it's just constant playing all the time, just at a lower level. Um, so, yeah. Um, what's the name of that melody? Oh, that's about cello suite, yeah. That one is in the uh, store. I've got a coaching course for it. The black, uh, Blackbird piece is uh, uh, definitely a challenge. Uh, yeah, when you do that, that... Uh, just the moving of those chords. Actually, chords are a really good... That's, it's, you know, you've got to get your fingers moving around with the, with the chords. It's, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good little warm-up and good little bit of practice. I took a lesson with the late Victor Bailey and he told uh, that you're lucky that you can play for fun. I guess maybe stressful to play for a living. <laughs> yeah, it's got a good point. I talked about that in the last lesson, about how I just became so jaded from playing um, when I was just doing it all the time. I much prefer playing now to ever uh, that I did when I was playing. Like, I mean, it depends what you're doing. I mean, if you're Marcus Miller, he probably loves. I don't know, he might not. But like, um, if you if you're playing for some really for a band that you love and you play, then it's probably a lot more enjoyable. But if but when, see if you're playing for a living, you have to accept things a lot of the time that you might not necessarily like playing. Most of the time. The stuff that I was playing as a professional bass player, I had no interest in whatsoever. I was bored out of my brain for a lot of it. You know, and that, that just, you just get bored. Even stuff that I liked, even stuff that we would play that I initially liked, you play it 500 times and you'll hate it. You know, it just becomes so, ugh. Um, thanks, Martin. I saw YouTube on Isle of Wight. A lot of homes, buildings that are follow it falling apart. They can make that place a nice area. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, that, I mean, it's it's a nice place to live, the Isle of Wight. Was it Turd Towns that you watched? There's a bit of a funny little documentary all about it, but they, they couldn't really find anything that was that bad. Um, Unlike, you know, where I'm from originally. If you went up to Wakefield or Leeds, there's plenty of pretty uh, naff places up there. Improvising over whatever comes on the TV. Yeah, I used to do that. I used to play over the adverts that were on in between things. I'd just start jamming along to them. Or I'd just put the radio on and I'd just jam along to whatever came on. So I'd very quickly try and work out what the chord progression was by the end of the tune. So... After completing base fundamentals, which course do you suggest? Well, either Groove Trainer, um, and you have to you have to bear with it because Groove Trainer starts with the most basic grooves you can possibly imagine, like that. You know, but eventually they get 
you know, they develop. But the idea is that you're working on really good technique and sound fundamentals at that lower level. A, a few people when they bought it thought it was like way below their level. And it's like, no, that's, you can practice technique with that. Now, good example. Somebody was just asking about the uh, joint bar in that I talk about. Well, if we, I was just to play it, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. If I give, if that was in one of my courses and it was like a groove that you had to work on, you might look at it and go, oh, that's too easy. I can easy do that. That's not what the exercise is. Listen to what I played there. This is the exercise. Consistency of tone. You need to work on those kind of things, those basics of technique at slower tempos. Consistency of volume. Just that. Now that's not in the groove tone, of course, but um, that's the point that you start with the absolute basics and work on all that stuff progressively as you build up. Um, you know, it's, it, it, you don't expect all of a sudden to be playing Jaco Pastorius grooves, you know, as in the first few etudes, you know. And the idea is that it's progressive, so that you start with the, the most basic ones and then eventually build up to, uh, you know, advanced 16th note funk grooves. Uh, I bought my first bass on May 24th this year, so I feel like an absolute beginner, but I'll be studying that cello bark suite. Oh my god! Well, go for it! See how you do. One transcription I can't get is the intro to Don't Look Now by uh, Go West. Could you have a look at this? Um, well, I could do, but it's again, when I said about the things that I'll break down on the channel, a lot of the time the stuff that um, people suggest won't really do that well. And you only need a couple of videos that don't do well for your channel to uh, fall out of its arse. So, um, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't do it on the channel. Um, I would love hearing you speaking of the sound of bass, the importance of compression, a little overdrive. I've done quite a few lessons on that. And I, I talk about that a lot in the Basic Fundamentals course. I do a full module on effects and tone, but I've done a few tone videos on YouTube. In fact, I've done loads. The thing is, I've done over 600 videos on YouTube now, and I think people sometimes um, see a few of them, like a scattering of them. Even if you've, I mean, somebody that's watched a lot of mine might have only watched 20, but there's 600 of them. So there's a lot of stuff in there and you just have to go looking for it. Um, yeah, Samandal, size of the upright fingerings is one, two, four. The lines, uh, the hand up with each position. Electric bass has one finger per fret. N but it doesn't always. Like, if I'm playing down here, I use what you would consider Samandal. I've never, unless I'm playing a scale. See, this is the thing. People think that a bass, you've got to have this one finger per fret stretch and all that. But you don't. It's like, if I'm sat here, I'm never going to play an octave with first and third finger. You know, it's going to be first and fourth, no matter where I am. Even if I might play with first and third if I'm up here, but nobody would. Everything that you do down there is going to be that. You know, it's always going to be, you know, first finger, first fret, fourth, uh, fourth finger on the third fret, unless you're playing something like a natural minor scale. Then you would. So it all depends on what you're playing. Uh, but for general stuff, you know, it's going to be one, two, and four for me down there. And I've got big hands, by the way. They're not massive. They're not huge. They're not Paul Sykes' hands. But they're, they're, I do have pretty big hands for my height and size. Uh, my old band used to get beer cans thrown at us while playing on stage not because we were that bad because that's the type of players it was yeah um i remember our old drummer had a baseball bat under his um under his uh drum stool because uh, of some of the places that we used to play we must nearly got beat up by a bunch of bouncers because we're, I, end, I ended up throwing my 
we ended up going a bit nuts backstage in this particular place in Bradford. I won't name the place, but I ended up sticking my base. This, this one, actually, the headstock, I slammed it through the wall just in some kind of, you know, drunk stupor. And, uh, yeah, the, we had to do a runner. Um, but, yeah, I've had all kinds of... Everybody has things happen. Like, over the years, I mean, the number, I'd love to amass a book of musicians gig stories you know just stuff that's happened while you've been gigging because you get to over the years the thousands of gigs that you would eventually play you end up with all these tales about things that have happened and um it's such an, an odd environment you know and so all these things i've, I've had people die in the crowd uh, a few times actually I had people smash the broke the once had an old an old guy break his leg um, it was it was a this was a ballroom set. This was like as dull a gig as you can possibly imagine. And they were on the dance floor ballroom. And this old guy was in his eighties. He uh, he slipped and he got a compound fracture in his leg. In his uh, I think in his shin, it completely snapped. And we heard it over the music. It went crack. I was like, oh, didn't know what to do then. <laughs> I was band leader at that time. Um, I just did to what they pulled the curtains shut and I told um, I just said to um, to guys says oh quick uh, because they were getting an ambulance and all that and they were trying to treat him and I'm like what the hell are we supposed to do and uh, yeah they cut they shut the curtains and I just says look play girl from Ipanema so he just whipped into the girl from Ipanema you can imagine this dude screaming on the floor and we're there with these curtains shut and going da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah so that was quite funny uh, but yeah we've had a, I've had um, yeah I won't I won't go into the deaths but we've had a couple of deaths in in gigs before and um, and I had a fire uh, I've had we've I've, I was on stage once. This was in a theatre, and I remember seeing this smoke coming out from like like the side of the stage, and one of the lights had actually set the um, one of the cloths on fire, and uh, nobody had noticed, and the, uh, no alarms had gone off or anything, or sprinklers. I'm like, man, and I'm trying to get people's attention, and then then you know, and then it all happened. But yeah, loads of fights. I mean, especially back when I used to be in metal bands and stuff, and punk bands, so there used to be fights all the time. But it's, you know, you get older. I mean, obviously, we've been attacked by pirates. So that's that's a pretty good one. Um, what else has happened? Ah, there's just so many stories about things that have happened. And like I say, the, you know, no matter who it is, from the most famous right down to the, to the bottom of the barrel, you do a lot of gigs. You're going to have all these tales. And I would just love, a, a, like, a... A big fat book filled with all these different tales. It'd be so good, you know, like tours, tales from the road or something. How do you get your bass sounding so good over live stream? I don't know. I'm just going direct. I'm going into a Yamaha AG, whatever it is. Uh, direct in. Uh, oh no, sorry, I'm going through a, a Zoom B3, and I've actually got um, I've got an Ampeg um, amp sim in there, and that's it. That's it. But normally I don't even have the amp sim kicked in, so it's just direct. And in some, and I'm just going into X split. I'm not doing any anything be anything. Uh, in on the computer itself in terms of the sound it's going in through a UR22 Steinberg uh, interface but that doesn't do anything to the sound really I mean it's got f it's just going in on standard mic um, preamp so I suppose there's that but they're, I don't, they're not particularly good preamps on there really it's not like an Avalon or, or anything like that Um, right, I'm going to get moving in a sec because I'm starving. Hi, Joe. What kind of camera are you using for your channel or is it an iPhone? Oh, no. Um, what, for this or for the other videos? The other videos I use are uh, Canon. Uh, oh, it's a DSLR. I'm trying to remember which Canon it is now. Uh, I can't remember. Is it a D90? No. 
Um, I can't remember. Uh, and then for this, I'm using a Logitech Brio. Um, it's a 4K um, webcam. But I'm going to get a DSLR for in here. I want to switch over to Blackmagic uh, cameras. I once said Scott Define was a low-level gangster. If this is true, it could be an episode of The Twilight Zone. <laughs> Where did you hear that? Not from me. I'm just interested. Stolen equipment is always a problem. Um, yep. Um, oh, I've had so much stuff nicked. Yeah. It's usually tools, though. You know. Four ways. Um, yeah, Guy Pratt's book. Yeah, that's a good one. How light are those GR-based amps and cabs? Incredibly light. I can lift it with my little finger. Maybe I've got the strongest little finger in the world, but um, I can lift them with my little finger. Not both of them together. I probably have to use two little fingers for that. Hi, Chef Sean. Our singer did a stage dive and everyone moved out of the way. It was okay, just a few scraps. Um, one of the gigs that I did, I've, taught, I've told this story before, I think. It was in Ireland. I was playing with a, um, with a uh, ska band. Uh, the brother was in that, actually. Uh, and we were touring Ireland. And we did a gig in a place, where was it? A place called Yoel, um, down on the south coast. And... Um, we had a complete cock-up of a day. It was the worst gig I've ever done in terms of... I mean, it was actually not a bad gig in terms of the actual people there. But um, it was just everything that could go wrong went wrong. So we so we had to set off from court. We were staying at court because my brother and some of the other band mates had, uh, had got a house there. They'd, they'd moved to Ireland. So we, we just went over to do this tour there because of that. And so their house was in Cork and then yours further down. So however far that is. Uh, to cut a long story short, we, we'd done a gig the night before, I think, in Galway, um, or no, in Limerick, I think. And then we came down uh, directly from there, and we'd forgotten the all the cables for the PA. And so we got there, and there were three um, hen nights in. So we got a load of absolute pissed-up girls going crazy. I mean, it's one thing when you've got stag dudes, and there's guys that are, like, going nuts when they jump. But, God, women are... A mental when they go <laughs> you know, when they're in groups it was like they're so much more manic and so they're all just like dressed up you know because whoever the bride you know to be you know they're all like they're all going nuts uh, and we don't have any gear so we've set up that we set up the pa my brother went uh, this will be for mobile phones as well before cell phones so he went up in the van to go get the stuff, and then we realized that we'd left something else. I can't remember what it was. So then another lad that was with us, the drummer, he got in the car, and he went up because we couldn't get in touch with my brother because we didn't have cell phones. So he's gone. So there's two of the band gone, right? And we're, and so it, by this point, it's like 8 o'clock. I think we were due on stage at 9. We're, like, trying to tell the dude that ran the place. We're like, oh, man. Uh, uh, oh, we just um, – we kept making up excuses. I can't, rem I can't remember what excuses we came up with. So anyway, they came back. We, we managed to get on stage probably about 20 minutes late. Everybody's hammered in this place. These three hen nights, these girls were going nuts. And in the end, one of them got up on stage, and our singer, or one of the singers, we've got two singers who was doing like bad manners things and stuff. And so Martin, the singer, he's there with his mic, and he's doing the, like, the Buster Blood Vessel thing, doing the scar stuff. And this girl backed up against him, you know, imitating a certain sexual move. So she's like stood in front of him, and she bends over, and he's singing, and she's she put her head up, she stood up, and the mic went clean through his front teeth and knocked them out. Well, chipped them all. They didn't knock them clean out. There were all this big hole in his mouth and, you know, shape of the edge of the mic. Went bang, you heard it on there. It like, mm. Anyway, he carried on, Trooper. And, um, and then the guitarist is, I think he's, I had a, I had a bass string break mid-set. I can kind of get deal with that. But then... The guitarist, one of the girls that was drunk, she kept getting up and, and then she kept jumping on the... Just because for the laughs, she just kept jumping on his... He'd got a big pedal board. She just kept jumping on all the pedals. And he's going, oh, you know, like getting really, really angry. So we're having all this go on. And um, in the end, we got through the gig, right? But it had been by this point, we're all like, oh, man, this is such a cock-up. Um, 
But we finished and we're having a pint afterwards thinking, oh, thank God we managed to get pull it off. There's Martin with all his teeth broken. And, um, and then we had to get this, we had this trailer that we used to put all the gear in, the big PV Heisis speakers. So it was almost like a converted horse box. So me and my brother goes outside to move this thing. And in Ireland, they've got really high curbs. And as we're moving it to go to, you know, put all this gear in, it kind of ran out of control. And um, and when, because we were going down a slightly down a hill, so it started going out of control. I grabbed it with one arm to try and stop it from smacking into this curbside because it was just going to roll. So I grabbed it, and as I did, I accidentally caught the top edge of it, the corner of it, which was all this horrible, like, sharp metal. And it just sliced across my hand, and I got this huge big gash down across my hand there. And I was like, ah! <laughs> Blood everywhere. To complete cock up. And we'd still got more gigs to do on this... On this um, on this tour so i'm bandaging that up and i'm like oh man am i going to need a tetanus shot or something i'm like you know like is it going to get infected because it were all like rusted horrible metal on the top of this thing so like a you know that just kept bleeding for ages um at this point as well because my amp at the time was underpowered um i'd got my i'd got blisters over all my fingers so i was in a right mess i were actually picking a lot of the time with like that one blistered up and then I'd just carry on picking, well, let's say on this hand because I was picking here. Uh, I'd start picking with these two fingers and by the end of the tour, I was picking with these two fingers because I just couldn't, I got a blister that went all the way down to that knuckle joint. So anyway, so we did that, so I'm there bleeding. Um, we get us back in the van, so we got two, two uh, one of the, so there was the guy that had gone back in the car, so he was taking some of the guys back to court, and then I was going up with my brother and a couple of others in the van with all the gear in the back, we set off back, one thing we'd not thought about because of this stupid run before, was that we were now out of petrol, so we set off, and this is in the middle of nowhere in, uh, in um, Ireland, and like, you know, you go down some of these roads, it was down all these country lanes, there is nothing there, so we're in oh, just fields for as far as you could see, and we're driving, and... I think our Adam thought we might be able to make it back anyway. All of a sudden, kunk, and it just ran out of petrol. And we were just stranded in the middle of nowhere at like three in the morning after this godforsaken day. And I'm like there, still bleeding, toilet roll around me hand. And uh, after all this stuff, and I was like, oh man, so we ended up, uh, luckily, I couldn't believe it. He says, hold on, I think I've got a little can of petrol in the back. And he did. He's like, so good with stuff like that and somewhere in the back we got all the gear out and he found it this little can and he got just enough petrol to actually get us uh, through but no cell phones in those days or anything so we'd have had to have walked off down these no street lamps no nothing just the middle of nowhere pitch black would have had to have gone and found i mean at that time there's not even going to be any stations or any petrol stations open so we wouldn't have been able to get anything we'd have had to wait till the next day so yeah that was a cock up so anyway there we go Sarah likes those uh, GR based cabs. I'll just finish these last few comments and then I'll get moving. Uh, when learning many songs in many bands, do you think it's worth memorizing each and every bass in the same chords section? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. I often like in the original songs. Learning many songs in many bands, do you think it's worth memorizing each and every bass? Um, do you mean bass line in a same chord section? I'm not sure what you mean by that. My plane sounds decent through an amp, but when I record something on my laptop via an audio interface, it sounds horrendous. Yeah, you might need a... Um, well, you kind of have to put up with that a lot of the time. You know, when you've got headphones on, when you're trying to play through something, you'll have that horrible ticky, ticky, ticky kind of sound. But you can get around that with an amp sim. So if you can use some amp simulation. Current routine, cyborg bestie technique, build a walking bass, learn songs, you're training. I hear you about spreading too thinly. Yeah. Yeah, so that's my story of the crappiest gig i ever did good gig in a way you know loads of women all absolutely hammered on these stag do's but uh, man poor old martin with his teeth proper smashed them in <laughs> she stood up so fast he was like duh, 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 and it just went bang it's like <laughs> broke them all i mean never mind me with a slice across me hand i think i've still got a scar across there i can't really so it's with all the lines on me and I can't tell which one it is but um, yeah it was mental anyway 
nice to see everybody. I will be back again on Wednesday. So uh, I don't know what I'm going to talk about that day. So I'm going to do another one on Wednesday. So all be prepared for another Wednesday um, thing. Remember, it's the 10th anniversary of Talking Bear. So we've got the sale on over at the website. So all that stuff that I've been yammering on about, or yakking on about, about all the different uh, areas of playing. Well, you can solve all those things with the courses. So yeah, so the 10th anniversary. And I'm going to be keeping it going, I think, for the whole of this month. It's going to be a good anniversary month. And if you've not seen the blog post yet where I talk about the history of Talking Bass, go check out that on the website. And uh, I will see you all on Wednesday. <laughs>